Good afternoon, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Cytokinetics First Quarter 2023 Conference Call. At this time, I would like to inform you that this call is being recorded and that all participants are in a listen-only mode. At the company's request, we will open the call for questions and answers after the presentation. We will allow for one question per participant. I will now turn the call over to Diane Weiser, Cytokinetics Senior Vice President of Corporate Communications and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us on the call today. Robert Blum, President and Chief Executive Officer, will begin with an overview of the quarter and recent developments. Fadi Malik, EVP of R&D, will provide updates related to Afficampton and other drug candidates comprising our early stage pipeline. Stuart Kupfer, SVP and Chief Medical Officer, will provide further updates on the development program for Afficampton. Andrew Kalos, EVP and Chief Commercial Officer, will speak further about commercial preparation activities for Afficampton and the market opportunity. Robert Wong, VP and Chief Accounting Officer, will provide a financial overview of the past quarter, and Ching Jia, SVP and Chief Financial Officer, will discuss our financial outlook and corporate development strategies. Finally, Robert Blum will provide closing comments and review expected key milestones for 2023. Please note that portions of the following discussion, including our responses to questions, contain statements that relate to future events and performance rather than historical facts and constitute forward-looking statements. Our actual results might differ materially from those projected in these forward-looking statements. Additional information concerning factors that could cause our actual results to differ materially from those in these forward-looking statements is contained in our SEC filings, including our current report regarding our first quarter 2023 financial results filed on Form 8K that was furnished to the SEC today. We undertake no obligation to update any forward-looking statements after this call. And now I will turn the call over to Robert. Thank you, Diane, and thanks for joining us on the call today. While we began the first quarter with a clinical stage program directed to the potential treatment of ALS, we ended the quarter acknowledging that we can no longer commit to that opportunity. In the best interest of the science and the shareholders, we must own that reality and rededicate to that which ultimately holds the greatest promise for patients. Toward that end, I want to emphasize our confidence in and priority commitment to our specialty cardiovascular pipeline of novel cardiac muscle-directed drug candidates. Despite the disappointment related to ALS, in the first quarter of 2023, significant progress was made across our cardiovascular pipeline with particular focus to Afficampton and its broad development program. As Fatty and Stewart will elaborate, screening and Sequoia HCM, our pivotal phase three clinical trial in patients with obstructive HCM, is expected to close tomorrow, enabling enrollment to conclude in a few weeks and the readout of results in the fourth quarter of this year as planned. We also recently reported data from cohort four of Redwood HCM, as well as 48-week data from Forest HCM, both providing compelling evidence for our next-in-class cardiac myosin inhibitor. Finally, we made progress towards expanding development for Afficampton with the plan to soon start Maple HCM, the active comparator phase three trial versus metoprolol, and continued preparations for our planned phase three clinical trial of Afficampton in non-obstructive HCM. As you know, during the quarter, we also received a complete response letter from the FDA for Omicampton McCarble. We're continuing to engage with FDA and are planning to meet with FDA this quarter to discuss their feedback and to better understand what may be our options going forward. We expect to provide an update when we have something more meaningful to report. In the meantime, we're pressing forward toward potential international approvals for Omicamp to McCarble. In Europe, we're engaging EMA in its review of the MAA and are preparing to respond to day 120 questions. And in China, the Center for Drug Evaluation of the National Medical Products Administration is reviewing the NDA submission for Omicamptive McCarble. As I previously mentioned during the first quarter, we also announced that Courage ALS, the phase three clinical trial of rel met criteria for futility at the second planned interim analysis. Our dedication to the ALS community over the last decade has been a hallmark of our commitment to novel muscle-directed medicines. 
and we're disappointed that we'll not be able to move forward a drug candidate for patients with this grievous disease. Given the data from the interim analysis, we've proceeded to conclude study conduct in Courage ALS, and we're completing closeout activities in both this trial as well as the open label extension study during this second quarter. We plan to present full results from Courage ALS at a medical meeting later this year. The trial was designed and conducted with scientific integrity and in the interest of people living with ALS, and we hope it may serve as a blueprint for how to conduct rigorous patient-centric clinical research. While we're certainly very disappointed in this outcome for Courage ALS, it affords us an opportunity to realize certain savings in 2023, which we believe can extend our cash runway and enable us to reallocate resources to further increase our focus on AFI Campton. Previously, over 60% of our R&D budget was already devoted to AFI Campton, but with savings we now expect in 2023, an even higher proportion of our total spending will now be dedicated to AFI Campton. Ching will elaborate further on our expected 2023 spending in a moment. So while the first quarter brought some unexpected setbacks, we remain as committed as ever to our mission to bring forward new medicines for patients with diseases of high unmet need. Our late stage, as well as our early stage pipeline of potential cardiovascular medicines provide a solid path forward, fortified by our strong balance sheet to support continued execution in the interests of all of our stakeholders. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Fatty. Thanks, Robert. In the first quarter, we made substantial progress across the broad development program for AFI Campton. In March, we presented data from cohort four of Redwood HCM at ACC, which showed that treatment with AFI Campton resulted in significant improvements in heart failure symptoms and cardiac biomarkers in patients with non-obstructive HCM. Cohort four was a dose finding exercise, allowing for two dose titrations with the goal of increasing dose with echocardiographic guidance and evaluating the effects on symptoms and biomarkers. As a reminder, unlike in obstructive HCM, where the goal is to titrate patients to a minimally effective dose necessary to eliminate the LVOT gradient, in non-obstructive HCM, the goal is to titrate to the maximum dose based on ejection fraction. In cohort four, by week six, 85% of patients achieved the highest dose of 15 milligrams of afficamptin. Importantly, despite uptitrating patients to higher doses, there were no drug discontinuations due to adverse events. As we previously reported, three patients had LVF drops below 50 at the week 10 visit. However, the LVEF normalized in all three of these patients after the two-week washout period. The data from this dose finding uh, cohort will inform the phase three dosing scheme. In terms of safety, Apicampton was well tolerated. There was one death due to sudden cardiac death unrelated to treatment with Apicampton. This patient had a history of sudden cardiac death prior to participation in Redwood HCM. And two days prior to the event, the patient's LVF was normal symptoms and biomarkers improved, and the plasma concentration of Apicampton was within the, inspect, the expected range. We and the investigator believe the death was unrelated to Apicampton and therefore remain confident about the safety and tolerability of Apicampton. Building on the presentation at ACC, later this month, we're pleased to be presenting further data from cohort four in the late breaking clinical trial session at the European Society of Cardiology's Heart Failure 2023, taking place in Prague. These results will include data from additional patients who are not included in the results presented at ACC due to timing, as well as data related to the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire and other additional findings. To provide some perspective on the goal of cardiac myosin inhibition in non-obstructive HCM, it's important to note that although these patients lack a significant LVOT gradient, their disease burden is measured by NYHA class and KCCQ, as well as biomarkers, including NT-proBNP, is just as severe as those patients with obstructive HCM. 
The magnitude of improvement in these markers of disease burden that we've observed with apicamptin were substantial, nearly equaling what we observed in obstructive HCM and provide a strong indication of treatment benefit. We're pleased with the initial data from cohort four and we view them both as supportive of advancing to phase three and highly encouraging of the potential effect of apicamptin in this important segment of the HCM population. Additionally, at ACC, we presented 48-week data from Forest HCM, the open-label extension study, showing the treatment with apicamptin was associated with significant and sustained reductions in the average resting and Valsalva LVOT gradient, significant improvements in NYHA class, and significant improvements in nt pro BNP. At 48 weeks, 88% of patients experienced an improvement of at least one NYHA functional class, including many patients who are no longer symptomatic. In those patients that reached 48 weeks, none remained in an NYHA class three, compared to 47% of patients who are class three at baseline. Reducing symptoms can have a profoundly positive impact on patient lives, and so these data are quite notable. Treatment with apicamptin appeared to be safe and well-tolerated, with no instances of treatment interruption or discontinuation attributed to apicamptin. We're encouraged that with longer-term treatment with apicamptin, patients are experiencing a sustained treatment benefit. Through these data, we're seeing not only a clearer picture of the potential benefit that apicamptin may have for patients, but also how apicamptin appears to show potential to optimize both patient and physician experience. During the quarter, we continued conduct of Sequoia HCM, the pivotal phase three clinical trial of apicamptin in patients with obstructive HCM. As Robert mentioned, we expect to complete patient screening tomorrow and randomize the last patient soon thereafterwards. We're tremendously grateful to all of our investigative sites around the world for working with us to achieve this milestone. Recently, the DMC reviewed safety, efficacy, and biomarkers for Sequoia HCM and recommended that the trial continue as planned. With enrollment nearly complete, we're pleased with the patient population that we enrolled and believe we're achieving our goal of focusing on patients who stand to benefit from apicamptin. We met four important targets for enrollment that give us confidence in the results we hope to see. First, the proportion of patients who are taking beta blockers as background therapy, which limit heart rate from increasing and can blunt exercise performance, met our expectations. Second, we enrolled patients with clearly impaired exercise capacity as evidenced by an average peak VO2 at baseline well below normal. Third, the proportion of patients using bicycle or treadmill to perform their exercise test met our expectations. And finally, enrollment in Sequoia HCM took place globally, enrolling a balanced and diverse patient population in the US, Europe, Israel, and China. We believe that the way we've designed and conducted Sequoia HCM and the patient population we've enrolled <clears throat> will contribute to a clear read on the potential efficacy and safety of apicamptin. Before I hand it over to Stuart, I also want to touch briefly on our earlier stage pipeline. First, in the prior quarter, we completed three ascending dose cohorts in the phase one study of CK136, our cardiac troponin activator, in healthy volunteers and expect data in the second half of the year. Additionally, following our IND submission for our second cardiac myosin inhibitor, CK586, we received FDA clearance to initiate its phase one study. 586 represents a key new clinical program for the expansion of our pipeline, and we intend to develop it for the potential treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, <clears throat> another important addition to our growing specialty cardiology business. With that, I'll turn the call over to Stuart to speak more on the expanding development program for Apicamptin, including Maple HCM, and our planned phase three clinical trial in non-obstructive HCM. Thanks, Patty. In the first quarter, we made progress towards beginning Maple HCM, which we expect to open for patient enrollment in this quarter. 
As a reminder, Maple HCM is the second phase three clinical trial in patients with obstructive HCM, during which we'll be assessing acetanthin as monotherapy compared to metoprolol. The primary endpoint is change in peak VO2 assessed by cardiopulmonary exercise testing from baseline to week 24. Secondary endpoints include change in NYHA class, KCCQ, NT-proBNP, and measures of structural remodeling. Our goal with this trial is to evaluate the potential superiority of acetanthin to the standard of care therapy of beta blockers. Beta blockers are used as first-line therapy for the majority of patients with HCM because historically there have been few alternatives. While beta blockers can improve gradients and lead to mild symptom improvement, a substantial portion of patients do not achieve desired symptom reduction with beta blockers, and they're associated with many undesirable side effects. Additionally, beta blockers do not improve exercise capacity, and when used in combination with a cardiac myosin inhibitor may attenuate its beneficial effects. If apicantin is shown to be superior to metoprolol, it may simplify the approach to treating HCM by enabling the use of apicantin as first-line monotherapy. We're encouraged by data previously presented from Forest HCM demonstrating successful withdrawal from background therapy in patients treated with apicantin. Hey, Robert. And, and Kanye, just wanted to call and, uh, to and our clinical the circle ups on the box here. And our clinical study sites are enthusiastic about participating in this trial. We look forward to starting enrollment in Maple HCM soon. Additionally, as Fatty mentioned, the positive data from cohort four of Redwood HCM presented at ACC were encouraging for our plans to further expand the development program for Affy Campton by starting a phase three clinical trial in non-obstructive HCM. We've recently had productive interactions with FDA to ready for this trial. We're finalizing our planning and preparations and expect this third phase three trial of Epicampin to begin in the second half of this year. We look forward to sharing more information relating to the planned trial design later this year. With that, I'll turn the call over to Andrea. Thanks, Stuart. In quarter one, we continued activities and preparations for the potential approval and commercialization of Afikanthin, including market research to further expand our understanding and better characterize the market and the opportunity. While the overall prevalence of HCM in the U.S. is estimated to be roughly 700,000 to 1 million, we estimate the diagnosed patient population, inclusive of both obstructive and non-obstructive HCM, to be approximately 290,000. Therefore, the undiagnosed population is sizable, up to 700,000 patients. We believe currently undiagnosed patients represent a very significant growth opportunity for category growth. Through our market research, we've learned that the vast majority of diagnosed patients are currently being treated with beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or both. And we believe approximately two-thirds of those patients are symptomatic and may be eligible for a cardiac myosin activator like Afikantin if approved. At the same time, we also expect the diagnosed prevalence of ACM to increase over time at a mid-single-digit growth rate, driven by evidence generation, commercialized treatment options, escalating patient and physician interest, expanding use of CMIs outside of the centers of excellence, and the overall appreciation of CMIs in the treatment of ACM. Additionally, during the quarter, we continue to engage further with payers who expressed interest in both HCM, CMIs generally, and Afikanthin specifically. Some payers have limited experience with HCM due to the lack of approved therapies until recently, but they are interested in the disease, especially in patients with OHCM or highly symptomatic. We see this as an opportunity for education and up-leveling of their knowledge of HCM over time. Our development program for Afikanthin has been designed to provide ample evidence for how Afikanthin, if approved, may optimize both patient and physician experience through quick and sustained improvement of symptoms, straightforward dose titration, minimal drug-to-drug -drug interaction, and avoiding dose interruption. Through Maple HCM, we're also attempting to show that Afikanthin is superior to the standard of care beta blocker to potentially further enhance patient experience by avoiding beta blockers altogether and enabling simple monotherapy. Finally, as we explained earlier this year, the majority of the commercial team has been shifted to support AFI Campton launch readiness activities should it be commercialized, 
and we plan to continue to assess our resourcing to account for the shift in focus from OMA camp to McCarbel readiness to AFI camp to readiness. We are fortunate to have a talented and dedicated team with deep experience in cardiovascular disease markets propelling us forward to become a global specialty cardiology company leading with Afficanton. And with that, I'll turn it over to Robert Wong. Thanks, Andrew. We ended the first quarter with approximately $704 million in cash and investments. Our revenue in Q1 2023 came primarily from a milestone payment we recognized from Xi Jing for the expected Phase three trial of Afficanton in patients with NHCM to occur later this year, as well as earned revenue from Astellas in the quarter. Our first quarter 2023 R&D expenses increased to $79.4 million from $45.9 million in the first quarter of 2022, primarily due to increased spending for our clinical development activities related to our cardiac myosin inhibitor programs and Courage ALS. Our first quarter 2023 G&A expenses were $49.7 million, up from $33.1 million in Q1 2022, due primarily to higher personnel-related costs, including stock-based compensation and pre-commercial launch readiness expenses. And now Ching will review our financial outlook and corporate development strategies. Thanks, Robert. We ended the quarter with approximately $704 million cash on the balance sheet, which represents two years of cash runway. To be clear, we're not adjusting our 2023 guidance today. However, we do expect to reduce our overall spending in 2023 by more than 10%, primarily through a reduction in planned outsourced services and headcount growth, thereby resulting in over $50 million in projected savings relative to previously forecasted spending for 2023. By employing these measures, we're able to extend our existing cash runway this year as well as in 2024, during which time we have previously anticipated incurring costs for manufacturing commercial supply, commercial readiness preparations, and medical education activities for route center. We expect to provide new fin financial guidance with our Q2 earnings call. To further add, add to our balance sheet this year, I'll remind you that we also expect to receive a $50 million non-refundable milestone payment from Royalty Pharma upon the start of the pivotal phase three clinical trial of Afikempton in patients with non-obstructive HCM, which is expected to begin in the second half of the year. And finally, on the corporate development side, to further support our balance sheet and our path forward, this year, we are continuing to seek a potential partner in Europe for Omicampton Macarbo, as well as in Japan for both Omicampton Macarbo and Afikampton. We also believe that we may need to open the aperture on potential European partnering of Afikampton as part of our broader cardiovascular portfolio in light of recent events. That said, we continue to prepare for U.S. commercialization independently, and as we progress our corporate development for the balance of this year, we will continue to make decisions that are in the best interest of patients and our shareholders. And with that, I'll turn the call back over to Robert Blum. Thank you, Ching. Today, our company looks different than how we expected to look as we started 2023. However, we're confident in where we stand and in the road ahead of us. We have overcome challenges before during our 25-year history, and we believe that with our foundation of a strong research and development pipeline rooted in muscle biology, we now have an opportunity to build the industry's leading specialty cardiology business. As we look to the future, we're optimistic and we have strong conviction in AFI Campton and also our other novel mechanism drug candidates advancing in our cardiovascular pipeline. Also, last quarter, we were proud to release our inaugural corporate responsibility report. This report reflects our commitment and continued integration of corporate responsibility throughout our organization, as well as decision-making processes, and our ongoing commitment to provide transparency and accountability on matters related to corporate responsibility. 
we intend to release an annual update to this report on our progress and goals, building on the foundation, and as we continue to focus on how we can better serve patients, the communities around us, as well as the environment. As Ching mentioned, we're in an advantaged position with the cash that we have, and we're managing it carefully. We're prudently managing our spending, our growth, and our allocation of resources. We have a promising development program with our cardiac myosin inhibitors, Afikampton and CK586, and in addition, we're equipped with an early stage and research pipeline that adds further to our portfolio of muscle-directed therapies. Our intention is to build value for our company through our science, and that has not changed, and we'll continue to balance the needs of both patients and shareholders as we advance forward. Now I'll recap our upcoming milestones. For Omicamp to Macarbo, we expect to continue to pursue potential international approvals for Omicamp to Macarbo, including in Europe and in Japan, I'm sorry, in China. For Afi Campton, we expect to present additional data from cohort four of Redwood HCM at Heart Failure 2023 on May 20 in Prague. And we expect to complete patient enrollment in Sequoia HCM in Q2 2023 with results expected in Q4 2023. We expect to begin Maple HCM, the second phase three clinical trial of Afikampton as monotherapy in patients with obstructive HCM in Q2 2023. And we expect to begin a phase three clinical trial of Afikampton in non-obstructive HCM in the second half of 2023. As well, we expect to advance our U.S. go-to-market strategy during 2023. For CK136, we expect single ascending dose data from the Phase 1 study in the second half of 2023. For CK586, we expect to advance that compound into a first-in-human Phase 1 study in this quarter, Q2 2023. And finally, for rel deceptive, we expect to conclude clinical trial conduct and complete the majority of closeout activities for Courage ALS in Q2 2023, and we expect to share results in the second half of the year. And operator, with that, we can now open up the call, please, to questions. To ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. As a reminder, please limit to one question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question comes from Sri Kripa Dunvarakanda with Truist. Your line is open. Thank you so much for asking my question. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for taking my question. So for Afi Canton, um, it looks like you're on track for enrollment completion in second quarter. Um, I, I just was wondering how confident are you about the timelines for fourth quarter? Could it, is there any chance that it could spill over into early um, 2024. And then as you see Canvio's launch and whatever you're hearing um, from, from, gra- from the ground, um, has that changed what you think you need to do to prepare for commercialization of Afikampton? Thank you so much. Sure. So uh, two questions, really. Um, the first one is around enrollment, and we do expect to be completing enrollment, as you heard from Fadi, uh, such that uh, randomization and enrollment are both concluding in the month of May, and therefore we are confident to see results um, in the fourth quarter of this year. With regard to uh, a potential commercial launch of Afikampton, we're monitoring the uptake in cardiac myosin inhibitors as a class um, carefully, and we like what we see. We believe that um, the Um, market is evolving very much as we predicted, and we're not expecting that uh, that should change the way we think about the commercial uptake. Um, Maybe I'll just turn to Andrew to see if there's anything he wants to add. I would agree, uh, Robert, that uh, BMS recently reported their first quarter earnings and I think showed good momentum, Um, and we're hearing very positive things for uh, the category overall from clinicians, so it doesn't change the way we feel about it at all. I think, if anything, we're even more bullish about it than maybe we were before. Thank you so much. I'll get back to you. Sure. 
one moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Salim Syed with Mizuho. Your line is open. Uh, oh, Salim. Great. Hey, hey, Robert. Um, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, just one from me uh, on the enrollment of Sequoia. I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Um, Fatty, it would, I'd love to just get confirmation uh, from you or some caller on when was the last time you looked at the blinded aggregated standard deviation uh, for peak VO2 in Sequoia, and can you confirm that we are indeed sub uh, 3.5 on the standard deviation, There's no, and that there's no risk of trial increase at this point. Thank you. Is this the answer that there is no um, um, risk of increasing uh, enrollment at this point? Um, as I said, we're going to be done enrolling patients tomorrow, uh, and, and we'll finish randomization shortly. And standard deviation, I can't tell you exactly the last time I saw it, probably in the last week. But uh, it, it, it's certainly within the expected parameters. Super helpful. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Salim. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Tess Romero with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Good afternoon, Tess. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for taking our question. So one from us on non-obstructive HCM. So we're looking forward to the, the, the full presentation there later this month on cohort four. As we recall, KCCQ is one of the key endpoints you're monitoring for health status. Can you quickly orient us briefly to what magnitude of change you are looking for over 12 weeks of treatment um, on the KCCQ? And like, is there a change that would be considered kind of clinically meaningful there? And kind of what we should be expecting a, with respect to approximate baseline score. Thanks so much. So obviously, um, for the fact that uh, this is an open label study, you recognize that we've seen these data. So while we don't want to front run the data ahead of the presentation as a late breaker uh, later this month, I will ask Fadi to try his best to answer your question without being too uh, forward leading. Yeah, I, I, I don't really want to give quantitative expectations given I know what the quantitative numbers are, but um, I should say that, you know, the baseline data indicate a, a severely symptomatic population um, in terms of, of the baseline KCCQ score. And in general, um, expectations of an increase of five points or more is what's um, considered clinically meaningful. Um, and so I think those are, you know, that's how I would put that in context as you see the data later uh, later this month. And any other kind of analyses that we should be specifically looking out for beyond KCCQ that we haven't already seen to date? Yeah, we'll, we'll actually be showing data um, in relation to an, uh, the assessment of angina, which is something that um, hasn't really been assessed in uh, in, in a trial like this before. Um, so we'll, I think we'll show some of the first data in terms of um, angina score and NHCM. Um, we'll be looking at some of the echo parameters and, uh, you know, you'll see a, a, a greater, um, um, you know, more of the KCCQ data than just what the delta was. So you'll see the sort of the Responders that are have smaller or larger responses and and a proportion of people. Okay. Thanks okay. So much. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Charles Duncan with Cantor Fitzgerald. Your line is open. Oh, Charles. Uh, Hey, Robert uh, and team, congrats on nearing full enrollment of Sequoia. And thanks for taking my questions. I suspect there will be a lot of uh, questions on AFI, so I'll ask one on Relicentive and the FASTA program. I'm wondering, would that be an out-licensing candidate and XUS, uh, what are your plans for it? So right now, well, for um, basic. Sure. So right now, in light of uh, the fact that we're still conducting uh, study closeout activities, um, 
we really can't know for certain how the final data are going to shape up, but based on the interim analysis, we've seen enough data to suggest that it wouldn't be proper to continue conduct of that study in ALS. Um, we've seen signals of activity of rel deceptive and other indications in phase two, um, but in light of this phase three uh, result, um, we really don't have any current plans for rel deceptive, but we'll assess those again once we see the final study data. And that's both as it relates to U.S. and ex-U.S. We do have other uh, activities associated with fast skeletal muscle, and we're assessing how they may uh, contribute to our pipeline growth and advancement going forward. And uh, obviously, we also have other programs and research that read on uh, skeletal muscle and neuromuscular uh, indications. And similarly, we'll be assessing all of those together uh, in light of uh, this recent development. So probably can't answer your question well enough to your satisfaction right now, but uh, it is something that's uh, top of mind for us. Uh, I guess if I just ask, can I can I assume that you are very much focused on becoming uh, cardio or be, being becoming known as a premier cardio uh, innovator and, and not leveraging the platform more broadly? I wouldn't conclude that um, as generally as you stated it, but certainly our clinical pipeline is focused to specialty cardiology, and that's what we're going to be focused on with regard to a majority of our investment spending. We still have research programs that are uh, directed to other muscle types and other indications, uh, but those are not um, things that typically our shareholders are privy to in light of the fact that uh, they are earlier stage, and therefore we uh, keep them uh, still confidential. As it relates to what shareholders are mostly focused to, yes, I think you can uh, conclude that our focus is on specialty cardiovascular medicines, of which we have four such drug candidates now in our pipeline. Yep. Very good. Thanks for taking the question, Rob. Thank you, Charles. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Carter Gold with Barclays. Your line is open. Hello, Carter. Hey, guys. Uh, you've got Edwin on the line for Carter. Uh, thanks for taking our questions. Uh, we've got one on Abbott Campton. Um, how would you set expectations for how quickly Cytokinetics is planning to turn around an NDA on the back of the Sequoia data? Have you already started that process ahead of the data? And then a follow-up housekeeping question. Should we expect a press release announcing the completion of enrollment in Sequoia when that does happen? Thanks. So to answer your first question, uh, yes, we've already started that process around which we're uh, looking at timelines, how we might bring them in, what we can be doing ahead of uh, the results of Sequoia, and how we can move as quickly as possible uh, to submit not just in the U.S. but also internationally uh, for a potential approval of Afficampton. So that's very much a priority, and already in uh, recent weeks we've had many such meetings on that very matter. Um, your second question related to whether or not we're going to be announcing completion of enrollment, and the answer is no. Um, with regard to Sequoia, what we've indicated on this call is what we intend to have stand as our communication, which is uh, we expect to complete screening tomorrow, and we're going to be completing enrollment and randomization here uh, in this month of May. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Yasmin Rahimi with Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Um, Afternoon, thank you Yasmin. So Hello, Robert. Um, and thank you so much for always the thoughtful remarks. Um, team, earlier um, this week, we saw data from um, the Explore study conducted in China. And when we benchmarked the data versus the Explore study, it appears that the treatment response was greater. And Maybe, Patty, if you could just comment on, you know, is there anything different in the um, Asian population or is it just the baseline demographics that could have led to differences? And then more importantly, I guess the question leads into what percentage of the sequoia population will be in China? Could that also be impacted and maybe boost the results further? Um, appreciate any color you could give us in that regard. And I'll jump back sure. into you. Sure, good questions and good pickup. Certainly we noted that um, communication regarding the data in China, and um, I'll ask Fatty to comment, and I'm 
thinking he'll probably also defer to Stuart on some of that too. So uh, between the two of them, hopefully we'll get to uh, your questions well enough. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the first thing uh, has me to note is that, that the um, uh, Explorer China trial didn't use peak VO2 in, um, in their trial. So I don't think you can really speak to larger results per se um, since the, the kind of the primary assessment of function wasn't included in that trial. They um, certainly had sizable changes in gradients, uh, improvements in KCCQ and NYJ class that um, um, were, were quite substantial. But I, I would be cautious about trying to compare um, magnitudes of responses between trials that were enrolled at different times, at different geographies, and, you know, in different populations. Stuart, do you want to have anything to add to uh you know, I agree with that. It's always a challenge to compare across studies, uh, generally speaking, but uh, the results certainly look encouraging, continue to build uh, the evidence base for support of cardiac mice inhibitors worldwide. Um, as you know, with respect to Sequoia, uh, we are collaborating with our colleague Zhu Xing and enrolling patients in China. And um, patients from China have, have definitely contributed to uh, enrollment of Sequoia. So uh, we'll have a very diverse group of patients uh, when we have the final results to, to reflect upon and um, support, uh, you know, support our regulatory strategy. You know, we're, uh, we're not disclosing the specific number or the percentage of patients enrolled in China other than to say that uh, we believe it should be sufficient to support registration in China. Thank you so much, to you. I'll jump back. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Akash Tiwari with Jeffries. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks so much. Akash. Um, uh, hey. Um, so, look, in your view, what, why would partnering Afghanistan in Europe be in the best interest for shareholders versus an outright sale of the company, especially before Sequoia has read out? I was kind of surprised to hear that uh, on the call today. And what could really swing that decision one way or the other? And then any thoughts on releasing baseline characteristics for the Sequoia population mid-year ahead of the readout uh, for Q4? Thank you. So I'll answer the first and ask Fadi to answer the second. And uh, the point of that comment that Ching made was not to say that uh, we're committed to partnering Afi Campton um, outside of the United States, other than we think it's in the interest of shareholders that we assess what could be uh, possible. And to your question about, you know, whether we should go down that path versus selling the company, obviously that's not something that uh, we can address on a call like this uh, for the fact that those are matters that um, um, don't warrant uh, a discussion um, in light of what could be our corporate development strategy. Our corporate development strategy is very much to maximize shareholders for those matters that are under our direct control. And this is one of those things that we can control as it relates to the best way to uh, enable us to access capital and do what's best for science patients and shareholders. So we think it's incumbent upon us to assess what would be possible and the opportunity to this point there have been uh, lots of inquiries around AFI Campton, and we've been relatively um, close-minded to considering them. But in light of recent developments at Cytokinetics, we think it's uh, in our interest and that of shareholders to at least be opening the aperture to what could be those possibilities, and that's what we intend to do. Um, the next question you asked related to baseline characteristics in Sequoia, and maybe I'll ask Fatty to comment on uh, what might be our plans there. Yeah, thanks, Kasha, for the question. I've been asked this before. You know, we're looking uh, to see whether perhaps we can pull together uh, final baseline data and find a venue for presenting them. They won't come, you know, far in advance of, of probably the final data uh, from Sequoia or rather the top-line data from Sequoia. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll update um, folks once we have a, an idea of what we're um, planning to do there for sure. Thanks very much. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Jeff Hung with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hello, Jeff. Hi. Hi uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I know it depends on the Sequoia data, but 
how do you think about the likely potential scenarios for REMS on the Atticanthin label? Like, what would you think you need to show to have REMS that are less onerous than those for Camzios or, or to not even have REMS? Thanks. Well, obviously, that's a difficult question to answer until such time as we see data from Sequoia and also continue to have good data from the open label extension. But it is our hope that uh, we'll have uh, from Forest HCM as well as uh, Sequoia data that uh, would be enabling of us to make a case to FDA for what might be um, a lesser REMS or no REMS. And in that regard, um, it's really difficult to speculate until we have the actual data. But um, with the fact that uh, you asked the question, maybe I'll see if Fatty or Stuart have anything to add in terms of what they're going to be looking for that might determine ultimately our regulatory strategy that way. Well, you know, I think we'll certainly be looking at uh, how dosing was implemented, how tolerated, uh, uh, you know, adverse events related to the need to monitor patients. And, and as we pointed out in Forest HCM, um, where we where I summarized the 48-week data earlier, um, we haven't had drug discontinuations due to low ejection fraction um, or treatment interruptions. Uh, and, um, you know, we hope that those events um, are limited to the extent that uh, the <clears throat> monitoring of them can be appro appropriately uh, um, appropriately gauged, you know, if you will, so that maybe there's monitoring during the titration phase and and then at some interval thereafter twice a year or something like that. But. I think it'll depend on the data, and, and it's just uh, difficult to speculate at this time. Okay. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Jason Zemanski with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hi, Jason. Hello. Thank you so much for taking our questions, and congrats on the great progress. Uh, maybe going to the earlier uh, stage pipeline, now that uh, 586 is entering the clinic, can you provide some color over your developmental or development strategy in HEFPEF? You know, do you still see this as an opportunity for Afficampton as well? And maybe conversely, where does HCM fit in plans for 586? Excellent. Very good questions. And uh, I'll ask Fadi to respond. You know, what we're doing uh, in HEFPEF has become a central part of our development strategy, 586 um, is a compound that um, has um, roots in the same science and biology that gave rise to afficampton, but it comes from a very different chemical class with a different mechanism. And as such, we think it may be better suited for our development in HEFPEF. And Fatty can speak about the therapeutic hypothesis and how we see that rolling forward. Yeah, hi. So, you know, CK586, um, as we uh, have developed it and has a lot of the same properties of Apicampton in that it has a shallow exposure response relationship. We think it's relatively clear of drug-drug interactions. We um, um, think the dosing should be predictable. The PK should be appropriate for uh, something that needs to be titrated and reversible. Uh, and, you know, what we have strategically uh, decided to do is to really separate the development of HCM from HEPPEF by using Afficampton and, and, you know, developing that specifically into HCM. Uh, there's a lot of, obviously, the patient population there is very different than the HEPPEF population, whereas 586 is something that would be developed specifically into HEPPEF um, and, and thereby, uh, you know, not sort of confuse one drug versus the other and where to use it and so forth. So. Um, you know, we look forward to starting the phase one for 586 uh, shortly and then from there uh, proceeding into what would be a, um, you know, beginning to look at this study, this in HEPPEF, and we'll, you know, we'll get more details on that as, as we, um, as the program progresses. You know, certainly the work that we've done with Affie Campton in NHCM reads on what might be the potential for 586 in HEPPEF. And we see that there's a translation there that uh, lends support for this mechanism and warrants its exploration. Definitely. Thanks so much for the color. Thank you. One moment for our next question. 
Our next question comes from Jason Butler with JMP Securities. Your line is open. Hi, Good thanks afternoon, for, Jason. Hi, Robert. Thanks for taking questions and congrats on the progress. Just one about um, non-obstructive HCM. Uh, given you know the obvious lack of gradients here, can you talk to how you think biomarker monitoring could play into clinical practice here versus um, j just treating you know symptoms? Uh, you know, is is there something? Um, that, how do you think the, uh, the the practice could emerge here? Good question. I'll turn to Fatty and Stewart to answer that. Well, I think you know in terms of uh, how the drug may be deployed in NHCM, um, practically speaking, I think phys symptoms and functional improvement is what will guide the physician uh, more so than biomarkers. I mean, I think they certainly will want to look to see NT pro BMP go down as a sign of biological response, but, you know, we, we aren't going to really have a whole lot of um, understanding for quite some time in terms of how much it needs to go down and what does that mean uh, in the long run for the patient. Um, so I think in a lot of ways this will be guided by how patients feel and and whether, uh, you know, there's any continued room for improvement in their symptoms as you escalate the drug. Stuart, do you have anything, any other thoughts there? I think that's completely, completely right. It's just provides more information to profile improvement of symptoms and function and how that relates to these pharmacodynamic markers we expect to improve. I mean, it is nice to have an objective biomarker, you know, as, you, as you're do, dosing something. Um, it can sometimes be hard to assess symptoms. Um, so the biomarker is helpful, but it probably won't drive implementation. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Rohit Basin with Needham and Co. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Rohit on for Surge. Thanks for taking our questions. Uh, can you just talk about your regulatory strategy for Appy Campton in Europe? Uh, will the trials being run fulfill requirements, or do you expect to run additional studies? Thanks. Good questions, and um, we do believe that the conduct of Sequoia as is occurring globally, should be satisfactory to uh, requirements uh, throughout Europe and also uh, the rest of the world. So it's not just being driven by our U.S. strategy, but a global strategy. And same with the way we're thinking about MAPLE and the way we're approaching NHCM. All of these are intended to be global studies that should be serving our interests globally. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Madhu Kumar with Golden Sachs. Your line is open. Hello, Madhu. Hi, this is Omari on from Madhu. We have a couple questions. So first, what do you think you need to see from Maple HCM trial for cardiologists to position AFI ahead of uh, metoprolol in the OACM treatment paradigm? And then Second, are there any considerations to running a phase three trial for Afikampton that is comparable to Camzio's Valor ATM trial? So, um, two part question, one relating to, um, I guess, uh, effects that uh, would delay the need for septal reduction therapy. That was part B of your question. And then part A was what? Part A is what do you need to see from the Maple HCM trial for oh. cardiologists to position Afi Cantor ahead of yeah. uh, Metaprol? So I'll ask Patty to comment on both A and B. Yeah, so I mean, with regards to um, Maple, I would say that strong data um, showing that Afi Cantor produces sizable increases in exercise performance, KCCQ. NYJ class, you know, relative to beta blockers would certainly provide a uh, strong rationale in the guidelines for it being considered as first-line therapy. I mean, if, if Sequoia um, reads out the way that we hope it does, it, it'll show that um, Afi Campton added the standard of care is better than standard of care. Um, and what we hope to show is that Afi Campton by itself is better than the initial standard of care um, and, and thereby um, you know, provide the rationale for, for using it first. Because 
physicians really aren't that excited about starting beta blockers in their patients. They, they can be hard, <clears throat> difficult to tolerate and have side effects that, um, you know, they pref the patients don't really enjoy. Um, so these data uh, would support that. I think they're the interest in that trial and excitement by the physician community is also a good reflection of the um, importance of this particular question. Um, you know, with regards to the um, um, uh, whether we would conduct an, an, a Valor-like trial with uh, with Appycampton, you know, we haven't really considered doing that at this point. Um, certainly, something uh, it's. I mean, think about the cardiac myosin inhibitor class. It's sort of nice to expand the field as opposed to just repeating um, work that's already been done. Um, if we were to do something in uh, surgical eligible patients, I think we'd probably ask a somewhat different question and uh, and then go from there. But um, at this time, no plans to do uh, something Valor-like. Great. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Ash Verma with UBS. Your line is open. Hello. Uh, Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, so for chemzios, I, uh, it seems like bulk of the use is coming from the uh, 2.5 and 5 mg doses and higher doses are not being used. Uh, so does that indicate that presumably physicians are not able to titrate up, thus underlining the need for a safer yet effective drug for HCM? Um, and on the flip side of the argument, do you think like if the real-world incidence of systolic dysfunction is below what was seen in the clinical study, uh, can the FDA relax the REMS uh, at the request of BMS? So I think those, um, that two-part question is better meant for BMS to answer, not for cytokinetics. I don't think it's appropriate for us to be commenting on the dosage strengths of uh, CAMS-DIOS and what that means for patients uh, or otherwise what might be necessary for removal of the REMS program. Um, we certainly have our views, but I don't think that's uh, something that we ought to be sharing publicly. Thanks. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Dane Leon with Raymond James. Your line is open. Hey, Dane. Hi. Um, congrats on the progress. Uh, I'll keep it short because it's been a really long day. Um, the the question I'd be interested in hearing from from your team is, as you go into the pivotal results and read out Sequoia, um, how are you thinking of taking those results, which is obviously a very comp study to the predicate that supported the approval of Mapcampton, and, you know, one, uh, positioning those results um, in terms of discussion with FDA and what you would want from a labeling discussion and think is very important to have on the label. Uh, to help differentiate uh, the drug in its clinical utility uh, versus Mavicampin. And then secondly, uh, bring forward to uh, the clinical community to help them understand potential advantages of getting patients through that really grinding 12-month process that, um, you know, continues to be a headache uh, with cam -Zios. So any any initial thoughts there? Obviously, we know it's ahead of the study results, but um, – you know, I think we kind of know where, where things are going. Thanks. Here again, it's not for us to be t commenting on something in a comparative way to Gamzios. What I will say is that we've developed Afficampton, um very much with an eye on demonstrating some of its properties for what could be an optimal cardiac myosin inhibitor um, as it relates to efficacy, tolerability, safety, and convenience. And now, I'll ask Fatty to maybe respond to your questions as to, you know, what we'll be specifically looking for, uh, and maybe Andrew wants to comment as well as to, to how it might play ultimately into the marketplace. But, you know, our goal is to ensure that cardiac myosin inhibition is something that uh, physicians are comfortable reaching for when they think about their patients, obstructive and non-obstructive, and not just those cardiologists who might be in centers of excellence, but cardiologists uh, 
outside of those centers who might also be encountering those types of patients. So maybe, Thaddy, you want to start? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, obviously we've, um, we're hoping that the data from Sequoia will support a label that will make the drug easy for patients to use, easy for physicians to use, um, and um, maximize its safety and tolerability. Um, that, those data will be shared with FDA. Those discussions will be had. Um, we recognize that there's a lot of patient burden here in terms of dose escalation because of the need for echoes and things like that and monitoring. And our goal will be to, uh, if you will, um, um, go with the data. What they suggest is necessary uh, as a means of maximizing safety and minimizing patient burden. Uh, and I think that's in the interest of patients, and, and the FDA usually has the interest of patients in mind. And from um, a commercial point of view, we certainly won't have com comparative data for chemzios, and we won't be comparing. Our focus will be on our data and how that leads to a label that Fatty described, making sure that we educate a broad range of cardiologists, not just centers of excellence, that we get uh, market access, that we support patients through patient services, and that the market landscape and ecosystem, payers, treaters, and all HCPs are very clear on uh, Afficantin and the potential benefits and risk so they can make an informed choice. And that's really what we'll focus on. Great, thanks. Thank you. Operator? Next Operator, are you still with Justin us? Kim with Oppenheimer. Thank you. Um, hi, hi, Robert and team. Uh, good evening. Um, you know, I'll just, I'll just have maybe one question on, on Maple. As this study is sort of more important for answering clinical and commercial questions and not necessarily regulatory ones, are there any specific populations that the team is hoping to treat and see the benefit of Afficantin in, and, and that may differ from Sequoia? Well, I think that is um, <clears throat> the purpose of the, you know, expanding the development program to include NHCM, and maybe I'll ask Stuart to comment on how that complements the patient population in Sequoia. Asking about people. I, I get it, but maybe he's asking about expanding the patient population. Right. Yeah. So in you know in Sequoia, we're studying patients who are generally later in the natural history of the disease. Um, most of them receiving background therapy um, for treatment of HCM, and you know we're considering um, targeting a patient population that is somewhat earlier in the natural history of the disease. Um, so, you know, th those details will be, you know, discussed uh, soon, but um, that's sort of generally this general the strategy because strategically we're interested, um, as we mentioned, in determining if aficantive would be appropriate for first-line therapy and potentially superior to the current standard of care of beta blocker treatment. Uh, maybe just yeah, a follow-up yeah. yeah. well, Go ahead, Justin. I was just going to ask, I mean, is, is it right to think about Maple as maybe a setting where you hope myosin in addition might be best optimized because you're you're sort of preserving EF just and that way you could show a benefit in a, in a milder disease patient? You know, I think in um, – it, it, the question really is, is are, are beta blockers um, – in, if you use a cardiac myosin inhibitor, are beta blockers helping or hindering the maxim, maximization of patient benefits? Um, and, and so Maple is designed to help us answer that question. Um, you know, in terms of patient population, you know, Maple, as Stuart said, will enroll patients uh, potentially with um, somewhat le more, less severe gradients, a little earlier in their disease potentially. 
you know, if we're trying to enroll patients that are not on beta blockers, you could imagine that patients naive to therapy might be in, um, um, patients that get enrolled in MAPLE. Um, but, uh, you know, think of, if you think of HCM as a, a whole disease entity, you have patients like in Sequoia that represent those that have high gradients um, and represent one portion of the pie, patients with NHCM representing another portion of the pie, and then maple patients kind of representing something in between, and, and including patients like those in Sequoia. You know, and, the, and ultimately the goal is to try and generate evidence in the whole pie and not just specific slices of it so that there's there's really rationale to use cardiac myosin inhibitors in patients with HCM and not, you know, specific subsets of HCM. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks for taking the question. Sir. Thank you. I'm showing no further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the conference back to Robert Blum for closing remarks. Thank you, Operator, and thanks to all of our participants on the teleconference today. Thank you for your continued support and interest in cytokinetics. We're looking forward to keeping you abreast of our progress with regard especially to Afficampton, which is slated for uh, quite a lot of news flow this year and uh, a commitment around our investment spending that I think is very much in the interest of our shareholders. And with that, we'll uh, keep you apprised of progress through the remainder of this year. Operator, with that, we can now conclude the call. Thanks very much. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.